Turn with me to Mark chapter 8. We'll begin reading in verse 22. And I want to jump right into our text this morning, if you'll allow me to. So let's just begin reading there, shall we, as we pick up where we left off last week. Verse 22, Mark chapter 8. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village, and when he had spit on his eyes, and yes, that reads correctly, he spit in his eye. That's funny. Or gross. Maybe both. He spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, and he asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. Read with me now verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now verse 31. And he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And we've prayed for our service this morning, so I'm just going to jump right into it, if you will. And I realize that as we read all these verses together, verse 22 down through the end of the chapter, they kind of maybe seem segmented and disjointed, but I can assure you they all go together. They all hint at and teach the same thing. And so here's what I want to do. As we just read all those verses together, I want to jump back up to verse 22, and I want to discuss several firsts that appear in the Gospel of Mark and even in the Gospel record. There are several things that happen in this text that we just read that only Mark records. And there's one thing in particular that it's the first time Mark mentions anything like this happening uh, altogether in in his Gospel. And so let's, let's itemize those real quickly because this is a passage of first in the Gospel of Mark. To begin with, if you're looking back with me at the text, verses 22 through 26, this is the first time a blind person is brought to Jesus. It's the first time Jesus heals a blind person in the Gospel of Mark. Now, we've come across many suffering people, haven't we, along the way in our journey through the first eight chapters. Jesus has healed a deaf and mute man most recently. He healed a woman with an issue of blood, a hemorrhage of blood. He healed a man with a withered hand. He's healed paralyzed people, lepers, and countless others with unspecified diseases. The list is long at this point. Ministry has been some two plus years, and so for two plus years, Jesus has been healing people everywhere he goes throughout the land. We've seen him cast out demons too, not to mention. He's not just healing physical maladies, but he's also dealing with spiritual maladies as well, and he's casting out demons, and we've even seen him raise the dead, bringing the little girl back to life. But as I mentioned before, this is the first time we see a blind person brought to Jesus. And that's important for us, I think, because of the nature of that ailment. 
According to Jewish sources, blindness was widespread at the time of Christ, and in the first century it meant a couple of things that would have made life doubly painful. If you were a Jew and you were blind, the rest of Jewish society thought you were cursed by God, that your blindness was because God was judging you for your sin. And we see that in the Gospel of John, and we've highlighted that thus far. The Jewish people had some very strange views about sickness and things like that. They viewed them as the direct judgment of God, and that would have been the case for this man. I don't know if you can imagine what that must have been like, living under that kind of cloud. But everywhere you went and everybody that saw you thought you were cursed. That would have been hard, wouldn't it? And then not to mention, because of his blindness, he would have been reduced to begging. Never learned a trade. Most likely, he never went to school. All of the opportunities afforded to healthy people would have been withheld from him, and so he would have been reduced to begging, and life would have been an excruciating struggle for him, a painful existence. However, I love the fact that he had, like so many others, some friends that thought if they could just bring him to Jesus, he'd be okay, right? Right? And and I think we probably could learn a lot. A lot could be said here about our responsibility to do the same. Another sermon for another time, whether it's by prayer or by introducing them to the gospel, I think a lot could be said here about our responsibility of simply pointing people to Christ, right? We can get so caught up in different issues in our culture that we miss the main thing. We can get so caught up in in what's going on politically and socially and culturally that we miss the main thing, that that we don't need to correct people's behavior, we need to point them to Jesus, right? And so I think we can learn a lot. And as I said there, I think that's a message, a different message for another time. What we do see, however, is these people, these friends, bring this blind man to Jesus, and Jesus' ministry remains tactile. He's very hands-on, and I think that revelation is by design. They bring their blind friend to Jesus. They beg him to lay his hands on them, and that makes sense to us. It's kind of a a token sign of healing. Jesus' response is to physically take this man by the hand and lead him out of the busy village, away from all of the noise and the distractions so that this blind man can focus on on what's going on, and be in the moment. We're not distracted at all. And I'd like to say this because I think this means a lot to the blind man. I think that touch, I think Jesus taking him by the hand would have meant more to him than any spoken word at this point because it conveys the Lord's intentions to do something for this man. It implies relationship. And care, doesn't it? Don't you know that? I mean, I still hold hands with my wife once in a while. We were walking through the store the other day, me and my kids, and my daughter just reached up and took me by the hand, and it just melted my heart. You know, I know the days are coming when she's not going to want to be around me much anymore, and that I'm rebelling against that. I'm kind of hurt about that right now, but for now, I'll take it that she just takes me by the hand. And so, The same kind of emotion is implied. That's not romantic at all, but the same kind of emotion and care and connection is implied here by Jesus taking this man by the hand. And as I said, this revelation is by design because Jesus is touchable. Unlike all of the religious leaders of his day who are aloof and withdrawn and untouchable, Jesus is in touch with the untouchable. That he's concerned enough about this man who was viewed by society as being cursed by God to, to touch him. And we see that all along the way, that he touched lepers and so many others who would have been considered the offscouring of the earth. And here's my point, that he was near and accessible to hurting people. I think that's very, very important, don't you? And, and I think that, again, implies some kind of lesson to us about how we should be available to culture. Not withdrawn, not separatists. You know, we kind of travel down that road sometimes. Hurting people 
need to be brought into contact with Jesus. We need to be near and we need to be accessible to culture in order to be salt and light. Amen? Hello? I think that's another sermon for another time. But as I said, Jesus' ministry is very tactile and as off-putting as it may seem. And we've already talked about this when he healed the, the guy who was deaf and mute. Jesus spits again. And it, this time it's directly applied to his eyes. He doesn't spit in his hand and then touch the tongue. That's what he did to the deaf and mute man. This time he spits directly into the blind man's eyes. And I realize that's hard for us to maybe piece together. There's some cultural things going on there. This would have been clear communication with the blind man, that he, somebody who had his senses deprived from him, that Jesus intended to heal him. And, and I think that's important. Jesus is trying to get his message across to this man who can't even see who is in front of him, that he intends to heal him. And I think it would have sparked faith in the blind man, don't you? That this man who had lived his life in a doubly painful way, an excruciatingly painful existence, who really had no hope of a better situation, all of a sudden hope arises, faith sparks, and all of a sudden, um, there's light at the end of the tunnel, right? And so it becomes a, intriguing to me that this is a passage of firsts, and it's the first time Jesus deals with somebody who is blind. It's also quite intriguing that this is the first time Jesus, after healing somebody, asks about the impact of his power. That is fascinating to me. It's the first time he asks any kind of follow-up. And I, I want to walk this through with you because I think this is important. And it gets maybe a little hazy. I was amazed this week in studying for this how different commentators interpret this passage and, and how widely varied their assessment of what is happening is. And, and I think I've settled upon a consensus, and I want to share that with you, but I, I want to I be clear about this. When Jesus asks the question, do you see anything? Now, track with me. He's taken the man by the hand outside of the busy, noisy town. He spit in his eyes and then laid his hands on him. The man opens his eyes, and Jesus says, do you see anything? Now, Jesus is not asking if it worked. He is not asking if what he had just done worked. The man sees, he just doesn't see clearly, right? When we look back at the text, Jesus, and he responds to the Jesus' question, do you see anything, by saying, yes, I see, but men look like trees walking, that, that he couldn't see clearly. Things were so badly out of focus that he didn't really know what he was looking at. Now that helps us interpret the passage, I think. And that brings us to the third of Mark's firsts here. This is the first time Jesus performs any kind of miracle in stages. That this is a two-parter. That he, he spits in the man's eye and he lays his hands on him. The man opens his eyes and he sees but not clearly. And so Jesus lays his hands upon the man a second time. And in verse 25, when the man opens his eyes, his sight was restored. And this time he sees clearly. Now that implies the completeness of the miracle, that it is finished. That he now sees and he sees clearly. It is complete. Now, those firsts are significant. I highlighted them for you on purpose. They mean something. What Jesus does and how he does it meant something to this blind man, and I want to know what it meant to the blind man. More importantly, I think it meant something to the disciples, and therefore it means something to us. And so we have to know what this means. Why did this man not receive his sight restored completely the first time? And why did Jesus perform a second touch, as it were? Why did he heal in stages? What does this mean? Could it mean, as some suggest, that the kingdom of God comes to people in increments, that it 
rushes upon some people that some people, when they get Jesus, they get all of Jesus, and then some people have to take Jesus in doses and in pieces because that's the assumption of some, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that's it. I think when we're saved, I think we get all of Jesus, that he doesn't give the Holy Spirit to people in pieces that he gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So I don't think that's it. Is it because, as others suggest, that this blind man was lacking in faith? That he didn't believe, and, and so Jesus had to do it in, in stages. That the first one sparked faith, and then the second one would have been completion of the faith. I could be, I don't think that's the case, because his sight was restored, he just didn't see clearly was, as suggested by some more critical scholars, this a hard case for Jesus? Was this something that was too hard for him and that it required a second work on his behalf in order to restore this man's sight? And that No, no, nothing is too hard for God, right? And, and so what if those are the wrong questions? What if, as we're trying to understand what's going on here, we're not asking ourselves the right clarifying question? What if it's, it's something altogether different? And I believe, personally, as I studied this through, I, I believe it had very little to do with the blind man. I believe what Jesus does in stages had very little to do with the blind man. I think he had made his will known. He, he clearly intended to heal him. How he did it and what he did, he did according to the counsel of his own will. And in his sovereign choice, he chose to heal this man in stages so that it would be an object lesson for the disciples. I think what he does, he does not for the blind man, but for the disciples. That it was an object lesson for them because spiritually speaking, they were so very much like this blind man. They had seen so much, but they didn't see very clearly, did they? I mean, we talked about that some last week with the leaven of Herod, but, but please understand, the one who does all things well seizes upon this teachable moment, and he chooses to heal this blind man in stages to illustrate for the disciples and, by proximity, us, their lack of spiritual understanding. They needed to be taught, just like this blind man. And, and, and therefore, they were very much like him. And so, because of this object lesson, something clicks. And that's why we take all of these things together. Look with me, verses 27 through 30. Now, because of this object lesson, because of what Jesus does in stages for this blind man, something clicks. And as they leave for Bethsaida, the house of fish, that's what Bethsaida means, by the way, the house of fish. Jesus asks them a question again. Who am I? He asks them to identify him through public opinion. Who do people say that I am? Well, you're John the Baptist, or you're Elijah, or you're one of the prophets. And the public opinion was wide, and it was varied about Jesus at this time. And then he asks them to identify him through their own personal experience. Who do you say? that I am. Jesus gets down to the nitty-gritty, as it will, or as, 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 as it is. So he says, who do you say that I am? And they were able to navigate all of that public opinion and arrive at the truth. They were able to wade through the, the false assumptions and come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ. That's Peter's confession, isn't it? That he is the Christ, the Son of of the living God. So at least for a time being, what Jesus illustrates for them about their lack of spiritual understanding, something clicks and they're able to navigate through all of that public opinion and, and all of the false information and they're able to come to the truth. Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. But when we get to verses 31 through 33, as soon as they bump up against a reality that was beyond what they understood, it unclicks. And there is a profound regression in their understanding. Whatever clicked, unclicked. 
because they, they came up against a reality that they were not comfortable with. Some things that they didn't understand. Once again, their perspective is challenged. And I know we talked about that last week, but, but it all comes together here again. When they were confronted with the idea of the cross, they do not respond with deeper understanding. When they're confronted with the idea that Messiah must die after being rejected by the elders and then be raised again on the third day, they don't respond in faith to that. They regress in their understanding, so much so that they miss the promise of the resurrection altogether. And they end up rebuking Jesus. Whatever clicks, unclicks. They rightly concluded that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. But as soon as they bump up against the reality of the cross, whatever clicked, unclicked. And, and let's pay attention, loved ones, to this idea that Peter, who is the spokesperson of the twelve, rebukes Jesus. We need to talk about that for a minute. Because there is something implied by the text here that we miss in our English translation. If we're not careful, we will read over it, and we will simply think that Peter is scolding the Savior, but so much more is going on there than that. The word rebuke means to denounce or to condemn. Mark has been careful to use that word every time Jesus interacts with demons. So every time Jesus comes across a man or a woman who is demon-possessed, he rebukes the demon before he casts it out. That he denounces it and he condemns it, and then he casts it out. And so Mark uses the same word here to describe Peter's denunciation and condemnation of the cross, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. And so we need to consider this censure in light of Peter's confession. Peter just concluded with the twelve, Jesus is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God. But now, according to Peter, everything Jesus said about the cross would never happen. Matthew's gospel records this, far be it from you, Lord, may this never be. That he doesn't just rebuke Jesus, he says, not so, never going to happen. In other words, may your will never be done. And that's not an overstatement. And, and, and so they're, they're having to come to terms with, once again, what was assumed to be true about Messiah. The promised Messiah was commonly thought in Israel to be a, a political, nationalistic figure who would depose the Romans and establish again the throne of David and sit upon that throne and, and all would be right in the Jewish world. That they would go back to their glory days under David's kingdom and the kingdom of Solomon when everything was united and peaceful and they had driven out their enemies and conquered them. And that's what Peter was thinking about the Messiah. There's no way Peter's idea of Messiah, there's no way he would suffer. There is no way he would die at the hands of sinners. And so Peter recoils at this thought because this isn't who he thought Jesus was. This isn't what he expected. This isn't what he believed. And so like the blind man, he saw, but not clearly. He needed help with his understanding, right? He needed to be taught. And, and, and so this time it happens, Jesus isn't so patient with them this time. If you jump back up to verses 17 through 21, when they thought Jesus was talking about bread, when he was talking about the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus says, do you not yet understand? He's very patient with them there in that conversation in the boat. That's an invitation for them to open up their eyes and, and look and see the truth and come to a conclusion there and, and be taught. Instead, here Jesus responds in kind. Peter rebukes Jesus, denounces and condemns him because of that notion of the cross, 
Jesus responds in kind, get behind me, Satan. He rebukes Peter and the twelve because of this. Mark 16, 23 adds, you are a hindrance and a stumbling block to me. And so Peter, the spokesman of the twelve, becomes the unwitting spokesman of the devil. And he is rebuked in kind as such. So, think with me on this. We need to think back to chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And I, I know I'm asking you to remember back a, a long time, several months ago, but, but remember what he did. We, when we turn to Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 4, and we find out a whole lot more about that temptation, that three different times Satan presents Jesus with different options. Command that these stones be made bread. You know, and you've been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. You've had no food and no water. You're no doubt hungry, so just turn these stones into bread. Take matters into your own hands. And, and you know, Jesus rebuffs that with the word of God. He takes Jesus and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. and says, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give them to you. He takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, invites him to cast himself down and put the Lord to the test. All these things he does, tempting Jesus to bypass the sovereign, foreordained plan of God to bring salvation into the world. Satan is tempting Jesus to forego the cross and establish his kingdom through another means. In other words, you can take the throne of David without suffering. And that's why Jesus rebukes Peter in the way that he does, because Peter has the same kind of perception that suffering was unnecessary and could be bypassed. Satan vigorously tempted Jesus, trying to derail God's foreordained plan of redemption, and Peter is doing the same thing. If he rejected God's purposes... And demanded the cross be avoided. He would have had Christ do something else. To pay for the sins of the world. And to bring salvation to mankind. But listen to me very carefully. And this is why this is so critical in our understanding of what's going on here. What Jesus came to do. Was indeed the foreordained plan of God. God determined beforehand. How Jesus would die at whose hands he would die, and then he would be raised again on the third day, that God planned that. And so we say things offhandedly like Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, not realizing that it was God's will, God the Father's choice to crush his Son on the cross for the sins of the world. God chose to do that. He planned to do that. And yes, it was for our sins, but it was not because of our sins. It was because God planned to do it. And so understand all that is going on here when Peter rebukes Jesus. May it never be. Not so, Lord. He is rejecting that idea of the cross. He is demanding that the idea of a suffering Messiah be bypassed. It's unnecessary and to be avoided. And selfishly, he was ignoring the purpose for which Jesus came. And so, according to Jesus, he and the others, the other disciples, simply did not understand God's will. You're not thinking clearly. You're not thinking about God's plan. You're thinking only about your plans. You're thinking about only what makes sense to you. And I think that's where we can now find some application. Because I think this in some way becomes a commentary of our existence. It becomes a commentary on the things that we face. Not just in those crucible moments, those catastrophes when, when things are bad and we don't know if they're going to get any worse. But in, in the day to day, when we butt up against a reality that we don't understand think this becomes a run, running commentary on our own existence. And so 
We don't need to just understand how the disciples were like the blind man. We also need to understand how we are like the disciples and thus also like the blind man. Because can we be honest for a minute, loved ones? Look at me for a minute. Sometimes we don't see very clearly, do we? Sometimes my focus is extremely hazy and unclear. And, and, and because of that, things get out of whack. It, that because I'm not seeing clearly, because I don't, I'm not clairvoyant, and, and, I, and I can't see the end from the beginning, that, that, that things get out of whack because they're out of focus. And my understanding can be so limited, just like yours, that, that I need help in understanding. And, and we talked about that last week, that, that when we need wisdom, that we can ask our generous God who gives without reproach, that he never reproaches us for asking for wisdom. But alternatively, and I think this is where we find Peter, and this is where we sometimes find ourselves, sometimes we don't treasure God's purposes either. Sometimes we treasure our own. And because of that, we think we can secure his blessing through another means other than that which he's prescribed. That, that we somehow can enjoy his blessing and peace with him and peace with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and not have to do what he says and not have to be obedient. If faith plays little role in the day-to-day -day because we don't treasure God's purposes. We think the work that God intends to do in us can be accomplished through another means other than suffering. That suffering in our lives should be avoided. That it's unnecessary. That we should do whatever it takes to bypass it. And, and by the way, we have built that into our existence. These layers of protection insulating us from the struggle, insulating us from suffering. And yet it is through suffering that God brings us into a deeper knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 says that we know him through the fellowship of his suffering. And that we are made conformable unto his death. That we are made like him through sufferings. Paul talked about the fact that he always bore in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. That he suffered for Christ. That should be true of us as well. And yet we, because we don't treasure God's purposes, somehow seek to bypass that at whatever cost, and we don't remember because things are hazy and out of whack and out of focus that we will reign with him provided that we suffer with him. And so eternity is in view. We don't remember what we learned in small group in the, gospel, in the book of James that it is through suffering that God has his perfect work. That we are to consider it a joyful thing when we fall into various trials, knowing that through that suffering, God has his perfect work. And so we're not to bypass it, or reject it, or to condemn it, or denounce it, like Peter did, but embrace it. And so to address this and to provide clarity and an answer, Jesus offers up this paradox, verses 34 through 38. This great paradox. Now I want you to think clearly with me about this. And I know that we're, we're skipping over some very critical information in order to come to one overarching conclusion. But just think with me about this, please. When the disciples were faced with the reality of the cross and they didn't understand what would be required of Jesus, Jesus invites them to deny themselves. When they're faced with a reality that they didn't understand, when, when they have to face their lack of understanding, Jesus invites them to die to themselves and to bear their cross, to lose their lives for his sake. Now here's, here's where we find ourselves, loved ones. 
when we're faced with a reality that we don't understand. And by the way, I think that looks different for a lot of us. Whatever that may look like, Jesus' answer is for you to deny yourself. When things don't turn out the way that we think they should, the way that we wanted them to, then we are counseled to die to self, to take up our cross, deny ourselves so that we can follow Jesus. When things don't make sense, deny yourself. Now, is that somehow incongruent? I don't think so. Jesus invites us to count the cost. Because, as he says to Peter, your salvation will cost me my life. And so if you want to follow me, it will cost you yours. And so when, we're, when, when we bump up against realities that we don't understand, like why is this happening to me? You know, we get a diagnosis of cancer, a relationship fractures, and, and divorce comes. We have an erring child. Whatever that looks like, we get fired from a job. We can't seem to make ends meet. I mean, we can just make a long list, can we not? When we face a reality that we do not understand, we are invited to count the cost because following Jesus will cost us our lives. When we're faced with a reality that we don't understand, Jesus invites us to deny ourselves and take up our cross. Now, I think that is profound, especially in the explanation that he offers, because if you lose your life for his sake, you truly find it. But if you seek to grasp your life and hang on to it and keep it, then Jesus says, in reality, you lose it, right? And so in further explanation of what this means, that means for you and me, when we need clarity, then we lose our lives in his. That, that beyond the morbid of self-denial and, and death to self and our own personal cross-bearing, then we have to allow ourselves to be completely consumed by him. Our lives our hopes, our dreams, our plans, our goals, even our ideas of what things should be or shouldn't be, they're all completely consumed in his purpose for us. He created us. He redeemed us. We are vessels of honor or vessels of dishonor to be used at his disposal and at his discretion. And I know that's a tough pill to swallow. But let's, let's think this through, because I'm, I'm almost done. That was the Lord's expectation for Peter and the twelve. When they didn't understand the cross, when they, they, didn't wrap their, they couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that he came to die for the sins of the world and then be raised again on the third day, Jesus says, you need to deny yourself, Peter. You need to take up your cross and follow me and allow your life to be consumed in my purpose for you. And I think the invitation for us is the same. When we're faced with cancer or divorce or an erring child or infertility or no matter what, no matter what that is, you fill in the blank. And we don't understand it. Why is this happening? Why is this expected of us? Why must we endure this kind of thing? You need to deny yourself and take up your cross and allow your life to be consumed in his purpose for you. That is his expectation, and I know that's not an easy sell. And we, we live in a culture that has sold Jesus cheap, that we can add Jesus to a busy life, to a full plate, and we can expect nothing but blessing and nothing but a, the, you know, life is just going to be dreamy. We can live out the American dream Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that we're going to be wealthy and, and, and everything we're going to ever, ever want it is just going to be at our disposal if we just add Jesus to our lives, and that is baloney. I have a stronger word for that, but I can't say it from the pulpit. It's baloney. 
Jesus' invitation to you is to take up your cross and deny yourself in order to follow him. And that your life must be lost in his, completely consumed by his purpose for you. And I know there's no way to soften that or or glamorize that, you know, because that's not fun. We're all wondering where the rubber's going to meet the road and what will be required of us, and we're all thinking about that extreme circumstance, you know. But to follow Christ, to be his disciple, there's no way to sugarcoat that. It's going to cost you everything. Your life. Your salvation cost him his. If you're going to follow him, it will cost you yours. That's the clarity that is provided. That's the illustration of the blind man. And that's, that's the rub between Peter and Jesus in this back and forth. And we need to see this clearly. And I fear that as we seek some kind of application that, that we have sought balance where there is extreme imbalance. And I fear that it's about the time we leave the parking lot, we'll have massaged this enough in our minds and diminished its importance that we'll forget. It'll be pushed to the back burner. We'll get carried away by the haze. And our lives won't be consumed by his purpose for us. They'll be consumed by what we're going to eat for lunch. Or what we're going to do Monday morning. And those kinds of things, look, I get it. Food is important. I love, I would be willing to bet that there's not a person in this room that likes food more than me. But that's temporary. Right? And as much as we enjoy it, God has given it to us to gladden our hearts, but there's going to come a day when we don't eat cheeseburgers anymore. I, I wish I had better news for you. Because it's temporary. And there's going to come a day when we, we don't drive cars anymore. Right? And, 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 and we don't live in, in houses made of wood anymore. And, and so a little perspective and a little decorum is required. And, 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 and I fear that because we so desperately want to live a balanced life, Jesus' invitation for us is extremely imbalanced. That taking up your cross and denying yourself is not balanced. That's extreme. And that is what is required of us if we will be his disciples. And so the invitation to you no matter what you're going through right now. And this, this has been kind of a crazy week for us in our church. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering going on right now. The invitation for all of us is to take up our cross. I don't understand it. I wish I had, I wish I had more clarity than I do. I wish things weren't so hazy. But I know this, Jesus' expectation for all of us is to take up our cross. And that I have to deny myself. Because if I don't deny myself, then what I want is going to supersede what God wants. Right? That, that I'm only going to think about my plans, not his will. And that, that I somehow, like Peter and like Satan, will superimpose my will and think that suffering can be bypassed and be avoided. And it can't. And so the invitation then is to take up our cross and to deny ourselves and to allow our lives to be lost in him and for his sake so that we can truly find him. Amen. So let's stand to our feet and let's prepare for an invitation. And I, I just, I simply invite you to do this this morning. You can do it right where you are. You can come to the altar Better yet, you can take it with you and practice it throughout the rest of the day and throughout this week. But I invite you to sense the weight of what Jesus is inviting you to do. To take up your cross 
to deny yourself. And so maybe how you do that this morning is you come and pray. You can do that if you want to. Maybe it's just a simple shift in perspective that the Lord is requiring of you. Maybe it's something far more profound that you are invited, not by me, but by Jesus, to die to yourself this morning, to deny yourself, and allow yourself to be completely lost in Him and in His purpose for you in order for things to make sense. In order for you to truly find your life, to find its greatest purpose and greatest meaning, your life must be lost in his. Vaughn's going to sing through a verse of invitation. If you need to pray, we'd be glad to pray with you. The altars are open. If not, let's sing together as we end in a note of worship.